of psychology and pop culture had a baby, they'd call it shrink tank. A new paper reveals more intelligent people are quicker to learn and unlearn. 90 percent chance that there's some like weird animal out there. Yeah. Alan Stern's been doing this forever and far more extreme. From Nashville and Charlotte, this is the Shrink Tank Podcast. Welcome, welcome, everybody. If you're joining us for the first time, a very special welcome to you. And if you're coming back for more, thanks so much for joining us. I'm Dave Verhagen here in Nashville. We've got a great show for you. Our trending topic today is Tom Cruise. Lots to say about that. But first, let's meet our Charlotte panel. Dr. Emma Kate Wright is here. Hello, Emma Kate. Hi, Dave. So do you have a favorite Tom Cruise movie? He's got some really great action films. He's got some serious films, some comedies. Is there any Tom Cruise movie that really stands out for you? I really enjoyed the Mission Impossible series. Just all of them as kind of a whole. Yeah. Did you, you saw the last one. We're going to talk about that in a minute. But did you see it? I did. I did. I how did it, it? How did it rank compared to the other ones for you? Um, it was really fast paced and I haven't seen some of the earlier ones in quite some time. So it's hard for me to kind of draw comparisons, but, um, I just remember like this newer director who did the last two, I, I think he's done a nice job. So I, I enjoyed it. Yeah. It was good stuff. And Dr. Frank Gaskell is also with us. Frank, how are you? I'm doing very well. Are you rested from your vacation? I'm rested. I'm tan. Lost some weight. Feeling good. You lost some weight? Shut up. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Such an idiot. So same question to you, Frank. Um, any favorite Tom Cruise movie? Uh, actually, it's Rain Man would be my favorite. Yeah. Um, I, I, I just I love that film. We're counting and, cards. And I, I like to I liked a couple of the Mission Impossibles. Probably the second one was maybe my favorite. Which was the one by John Woo? Was that the second or third? That was the second. Yeah. That was terrible. Which is usually considered the wait. worst one. <laughs> well, then wait. By far the Maybe worst it's not one. the second. What was the one where he's hanging out of a jet as it's taking off? Oh, that was third probably third or, third or fourth, maybe. Fourth. I don't know. Okay, Somewhere then there. that one. Yeah, that yeah. one. That was a good I one. I like that. All right. Got it. Glad we got that cleared up. You know what's the worst one? That's my favorite. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And Jonathan Hederley, you just heard from him. He's our certified Asian who rounds out our panel. And Jonathan, how about you? A favorite Tom Cruise movie? I don't know if there's a favorite, but you know, outside of the Mission Impossible, I really, really liked War of the Worlds with Steven Spielberg. Like oh, that, that movie just one. totally caught me off guard. Me too. And, and I've seen that movie dozens of times mm -hmm. and it holds up. Yeah, and it, it, it's so true to the book as well, which is yeah. amazing. Yeah, it's good stuff. Well, we're going to talk about Tom Cruise in our second segment. But first, Jonathan trolls the Internet each week, and he finds a great story of psychology in the news for our first segment that we call Being Human. New research published in the Journal for the Scientific Study of Religion provides evidence that college men who frequently participate in religious activities are less likely to engage in sexually aggressive and coercive behaviors. They found that religiosity had an influence on peer norms, pornography consumption, and promiscuity, which in turn had an influence on sexual aggression and sexually coercive behaviors. So, Frank, as our resident porn consumer, what do you make of this relationship between <laughs> religiosity and sexual aggression? Well, um, I'm sorry, you're uh, not a porn consumer. You're uh, a porn maker. Okay, sorry. Okay. <laughs> All right. So, there's that. Uh, going to come out guns blazing. Okay, here we go. Don't talk I, about guns blazing with porn. I'll okay. tell you what. <laughs> I think this is a really good study and it speaks for me more toward the effect of peers. So if you're in a peer group and you have this shared value and you're engaging in a particular behavior, like let's say religious belief or whatever, then you're more accountable to that group. You're more likely to kind of follow those norms. The opposite side, if you're in a culture, we'll say like uh, Hederly's fraternity, where you're sitting around, you're watching porn, you're doing cocaine, you're doing all these things, which is gives you a greater propensity to be sexually aggressive, I, it, it makes sense. However, as a side note, I was in a religious group in college, and the people who were not in the group 
spread rumors that we would go on retreats and have orgies. And that's <laughs> true. That is true. And that's true that you did have yeah, orgies? Yeah, the no, rumors it's were not true. true but, but the people who didn't know anything about what we were doing thought we were a cult and that we would go on retreats and have orgies. Mm. I'm Sweet. not making this up. Mm. So you had the reputation for being a guy who went to retreats for orgies, but you never right. got the orgy. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> they didn't. Bummer. The brochure was false advertising. <laughs> oh, gosh. But I, I think it makes a lot of sense. I think it speer, speaks mainly to peer relationships. Yeah, and I would second that. I think the reality is, like, who you surround yourself with and the values that are within your social group are going to really influence and impact your ability to make decisions um, in certain situations. Mm -hmm. That's and why I surround myself with goat herders. Goat herders. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's Good plan in there, Frank. Thanks. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, we've talked in recent weeks about some of the negative things that are happening in like evangelical subculture and things like that. But the other side is what we're talking about is that is that people have a commitment to faith. With that comes often some really good things, not just this misogynistic stuff or not just this coercive, narcissistic stuff, but also often... Uh, some really good values of respect for others and good boundaries and things like that. So I think that's, it's not, it, I mean, it is peer group stuff, but it also comes out of kind of flows out of the, the faith and values of, of the, of the individual and of, of the, of the person, I mean, of the group rather. Yeah. And I think early on, um, Faith and religious organizations, they really emphasize family values and how to treat people. And so if very early on you're building a foundation of how to how to view others and the dignity of other people, that can naturally lead to, as you get into teenage and young adult years, to preserve um, the dignity and rights of other people versus allowing that opportunity of freedom in college life to kind of go wayward in that regard. Yeah, and it, I mean, you can see on college campuses, there are definitely some groups and some subcultures that have attitudes that are, make it more likely that they're going to be sexually aggressive. Just makes, I mean, it, it seems to naturally flow out of the kind of the culture of that group. And then others that it makes it less likely. So, in one sense, it's not a big shocker, but in another sense, it's, it's good to see it in kind of in research, hard research terms. So good stuff. If you've got questions or comments about what we just talked about, you can write us at feedback at shrinktank.com. We'd love to get your comments and we'll reply to them either in social media or right here on the podcast. Let's switch gears and talk about our trending topic today, which is Tom Cruise. Obviously, he's got the hottest movie out right now. It's got legs on it. It's going to continue to be hot for several weeks. Some people are saying it's the best uh, movie of the summer. Other people are saying it's one of the best action films of the past two or three years. So let's focus on, rather than the, the movie making right now, on him. And I just want to get kind of a, a sense of what your take on Tom Cruise as an individual is. And Emma Kate, what's your, what's your kind of take, before we do a deep dive into the psychology of Tom Cruise, what's your initial take on him as a person? Um, based on what I know from his childhood, which is fairly limited, um, he probably has a lot of deep-rooted insecurity that um, has kind of manifested in getting a lot of affirmation and positive attention from film. And so he kind of developed this narcissistic tendency to really want people to like him and think he's great um, and have people feed his ego to feel better about being wounded. His dad beat the, his dad beat the crap out of him. Yep. How do you know yeah. that? Um, <clears throat> well, he said it uh, around the time when he and Katie Holmes were having their daughter, Siri, or Suri, and um, he also disclosed at that time, too, that he was, you know, struggling at school. He got bullied. He was dyslexic, and he was kind of miserable as and a he, kid. And he smashed his teeth up and wouldn't have photos taken of him because he was so embarrassed of his teeth. Interesting. Frank, how about you? What's your take on Tom Cruise? I, <laughs> I, I don't understand it one bit. It, 
this whole Scientology thing that has surrounded him, I, I just can't imagine what's happening behind those scenes to make Blackmail. this happen. And, and, and I'll say this, I'm going to be the dissenting vote, but I hated this, this Mission Impossible movie. I hated it. I could have left at any point during the film. Had you been drinking? No. <laughs> I thought it was <laughs> that was funny. Did you stand I, up in front of the entire theater at the end? Yeah, and, 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 yeah, I did. Announce how much you hated the film. Yeah, yeah. Not that that's ever happened before. No, right? no, 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 no. Hypothetically, of not. yeah. Very sober Hypothetically, moment. yeah. I I couldn't stand it, and well, I'm walking out thinking that Scientology stuff has gotten everybody like America confused as to what a good movie is. How could it be rated that highly? So I. I, I, I don't I, I don't understand him at all. I don't all. understand hey, you. Yeah, right I don't understand. Need to say, okay, Scientology For, has gotten America to I, like the movie. Is what you just said? That's kind of what I believe. I think he's in your minds, and but Frank, I, have you been drinking right now? No. <laughs> so, what I don't understand is how a guy like this can go through all the events he's occurred that that he's been involved in and still can be this successful. I, I I can't make sense of it. It makes perfect sense. Look at you, a wreck of a human being, and you're successful. I mean. <laughs> wow. 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 <laughs> Tell me I'm wrong, Frank. Roasting Tell Frank me I'm wrong. Back. I mean, I do believe that he's probably gay. Oh, boy. I oh, think, my God. I think, that's, I think that's why he was bullied as a no. kid. Yes. He had a learning he went, disability. No, he went and to his all these. beat him. And he was raised a devout he, it, Catholic. It, a devout Catholic. Raised by a bully dad, the dad left him, and his his little appearance on Oprah, where he's like jumping up and down. That if that's not a if that's cover, not what I don't know if what that's is. Not what Mania? Frank? Oh boy, All I wasn't right. going to talk about the movie too much, but do either of you agree with Frank about the movie? Did either of you think it was a bad movie? I liked it. It felt like Scientology propaganda. Yeah, Frank. <laughs> yes, Dave. I don't know what to believe anymore. Uh, it, it is so not, glad I came back okay, from vacation. But seriously, it's not like a fantastic plot line. There's or, no I mean, plot. It's, okay, fine. But there was more story and character development in it than others because it brought in characters and elements from previous Mission Impossible. There movies. was no character development. Uh, I, I, None. I, I like that. I liked the movie a lot. Um, I think. Frank fried a circuit at mm. the beach, oh my and God. he doesn't have many left, but <sighs> I really liked the movie, and I thought that it actually, you know, these you don't go to these movies for their plot, but I think there is actually, um, it, it's not as cookie cutter as on first viewing. Like, I actually did some real thinking about it, and I wrote up an article about how it really is a series of moral dilemmas throughout the the movie that Tom Cruise's Ethan Hunt has to face to where it you know there's a term called Morton's fork where it's like you have two choices and both are not positive options they they both lead to like un unlikable outcomes and that's what he yeah. constantly faced in this film it's like me being on a podcast with you <laughs> <laughs> Well, you remember, Frank, we didn't invite you. You showed up one day as we're podcasting. It's <laughs> actually kind of true. It's like, that's not kind of. actually that's not true. Yeah, that's 100% true. I was on Entertainment Shrinkly, you idiot. Do you not remember the inception of Entertainment oh Shrinkly? Oh, my God. I swear. Uh, well, I, I, I disagree with Frank. I, I think the movie, the best way to describe it is that it's corny fun. You know, it's a corny fun movie. The, the plot's corny. We've got to disarm three nuclear bombs but we can't do it until the countdown starts and then another guy's got a trigger device whatever that means you know in a helicopter it's all corny but it's all for the purpose of setting up these impossible situations that are just great action set pieces but i, I agree more with emma kate i do think they did some good character development i think the action set pieces were really strong it was it was an enjoyable movie i don't know yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm totally not there with you. So I don't think this is a Scientology plot, Frank, to get people to like the movie. <laughs> that, and then Tom Cruise actually did break his leg filming one of his eh, stunt scenes. So what? And he actually was the scene you spoke about with him hanging outside of a jet in a previous one. He did that. Like, uh -huh. he is actually very physical yeah. in terms of doing all the stunts uh, and being challenged. Blah, blah, blah. Okay, that's fine. Wow. 
But I go to these movies looking for a Bond experience. Like, okay, maybe that could kind of happen. Maybe you mean you go to a James but Bond? A helicopter for is Tom gonna Cruise hang. Movie? A helicopter is gonna hang off a cliff with a little hook. Yeah. What? Okay. Yeah. Oh my god. Sure. That's why you didn't like the movie. Um, that's one of many, many reasons. Oh uh, boy. Even when the head of the CIA, spoiler, leans over and it's like, go. Oh my gosh, that's bad acting. <laughs> so bad. I will say, I figured out most of the little twists. And uh, like, I figured out, we're not going to say it here, but I figured out who the bad guy was within minutes. I, I mean, like, I, I didn't think, I thought it was really super predictable, but it was, it was enjoyable. It was, I thought it was a fun movie. So, and who, who puts ahead. in two Supermen? There were two people who played Superman in that movie. Come on. Wait, who? Henry Cavill and who else? The other dude with the beard. What do you mean the other dude with the beard? That's Henry he, Cavill. He, no, there was another guy yeah, that was on the ice with the husband. Oh, no, no. He never played Superman. He never played Superman. That's Wes what, Bentley. What did he, he was, play? He was in American Beauty. Wow. He was in Hunger Games. Oh, that's right. American Beauty. <laughs> Not Superman. Right, okay, so everyone take it. everything Frank oh, wow. has just said very seriously. <laughs> yeah. Just fast forward through all that stuff. Um <laughs> So, Jonathan, back on task. What's your take on Tom Cruise as a human? Well, Frank's National Enquirer headlines aside, everybody that works with Tom Cruise says he's very likable and charming, and I I genuinely believe that. I I also think that's probably why something like Scientology or organized religion, because, you know, his his Catholic upbringing kind of fits his persona, somebody that— likes order and likes rule. Um, and so to me, it's, I mean, and if we've, if you've seen the Scientology documentary from HBO going clear and you, and you hear him speak, you could see how that charisma and charm on the surface could be re- really likable and engaging, but gone to an extreme, it could be really disturbing. And I think that he has the capacity for both. And it's really just a question of where he is in in life and who he surrounds him with. That's probably going to greatly determine if he just stays a real likable, engaging person, or if he might use that charm for manipulation and real rigid black and white type of thinking. So you said something important there, a lot of important things, but one of them was that people who work for him and with him legitimately like him most of the time. Like they, they say good things about him. And what's interesting for me is just, again, we're, we don't know the man. We don't, we're just kind of piecing information together from his backstory and his biography and what we know. But he's a very res- respectable guy in terms of work ethic, the quality of work, um, you know, the, the filmmaking, the, all that. And he seems like he would just be absolutely insufferable to be around in, in real life. Like just it, when you watch him in interviews, he doesn't seem genuine. When you, when you uh, see behind the scenes stuff, it seems like, uh, you know, there's this facade. But yet people really like him, um, seemingly genuinely. Do you, how do you make sense of that? Like what, are we misreading it? Or is, is there elements to him that we just don't, are not privy to? Well, uh, I actually can pull out of an anecdote from real life where I know somebody who everybody that's a, a friend or a professional colleague or just meets this person finds them very approachable, engaging, charming. But those that like spend real like personal time outside of the w- work environment or after outside of a performance space, um, <clears throat> they find – this person to be very controlling and off-putting. What's going are, on? Are you talking about um, Frank yeah. again? Yeah, here, here. I'm actually, yeah. I'm actually not. <laughs> I bet I know who you're talking I'm about. I'm actually not. And so, I mean, I have a real-life example of somebody that has that really, like, noticeable dichotomy of, like, professional colleagues and people that just know, know this person on the surface, find them charming and likable, and those that are really close to them, really, um, it's very difficult to like them. That's why he can't stay married. The more intimate the relationship, the more bizarre he gets. Yeah. Well, that that and then the whole Scientology thing. Well, right. Because in Scientology, they take your kids away from you. Yes. So There's that. Yeah. 
Well, yeah, and there is that. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> We're going to talk saying. about that in, in, in a second. But so you, you feel like he's one of these guys that if you had kind of casual interaction with him, you'd find him to be charming and fun. And the deeper you go, the more it doesn't hold up. Is that and, your kind uh, of re- Yeah, or the more it's like it feels disingenuous really up close when you pivot to like more personal or, you know, topics or interactions to where it, it's not about impressing somebody. It's not about gaining their, their likability. And, and it, it's really about having a very intimate up close relationship. And I just don't know how he does with that. I mean, and I think, I think Frank brings up a legitimate point, whether or not it ultimately is valid is that he's got a track record of relationships really not sustaining and there always seems to be these really weird um, questions about how much of a role Scientology and other people dictating the terms of a relationship and how much he's really 100% himself in, in those relationships. Well, you know, we've talked before about how difficult it is for someone of his stature to have genuine relationships anyway. I mean, we're going to talk about that next week also, but this idea that people that are in the spotlight that are uber famous or uber rich, you don't know why people are in your life. You don't know what people are going to reveal about you. Um, later the, you know, the, the, over time you learn to be conditioned to be guarded, to put up a facade. It just makes sense. It's a good way of defending yourself. I guess my question with it is, from what you know from him and his past and and upbringing and all that, do you have a sense that he would still be this way if he wasn't Tom Cruise? Meaning Tom Cruise, the very famous person who's also gotten tangled up in Scientology and so on. Do you think this is just kind of core stuff for him that would have been there or do you think this is likely the product of all these other things that came with the fame and the attention and the need for defensiveness no i i i think he would i think he found a platform that provides him an opportunity to be successful with that character trait i think it really ultimately comes down to control my guess would be I would not be surprised to see if he is a very controlling person in a personal life. And as a, a producer, as someone that's involved in a in a multi-billion dollar franchise, like and his aspirations and his talent, that serves him well in Hollywood. But and I think that would have if he ended up becoming a priest because he went to seminary, he was mm-hmm. consimin- yep. considering seminary. I know, I, I, I wish I didn't, but I know a lot of people in religious ministry that are very controlling and, and they're attracted to that, that occupation because of that very reason that they're, they're up on a platform and they get to influence and control others. I think he would have been successful no matter what it would have, if it wasn't film, it would have been wall street. It, it, it would have been anything that he could control and he would work his butt off at whatever it is. It, he just happened upon this because of what he was in a, in a play in high school where he kind of really got into this stuff. Yeah. And again, I'll kind of second and third that sort of idea about, you know, again, he probably was very anxious and or is very anxious. And so a lot of times when we worry about things, we attempt to control whatever we can. And so I think it would make sense that he is really driven and no matter what he pursued, whether it was religious stuff or Wall Street, as Frank said, or what have you, he would he would do a good job at it. And that's why in all of his movies he runs because we know exercise helps anxiety. So that's just how that's he gets out his restless energy. <laughs> it all comes together now. It does. Last question, and you've already alluded to this, but I'll set it up by saying when we were talking about some of us going to see the movie here in our office, uh, a good number of us, about seven of us, I think, went to see it. And a few people, one in particular, just said, I'm not going to go see a movie with Tom Cruise. And when we pressed on it, it the, the, the comment was, well, it's not just that he's in Scientology, but that he is sort of their upfront spokesperson and he's promoting something that is potentially very destructive 
and and bad for people, and I'm not going to be, um, you know, basically party to that. Now, I, I guess you could talk about that from a lot of different angles, but I I want to talk about not just with Tom Cruise, but in in general, how do you think about that when you've got an artist who might have something that's objectionable or um, wrongheaded or however you want to think of that. Um, and whether you support his or her art, of, whether that's in music or film or television, how do you think about that, Frank? It, it, it makes me think that I wouldn't be able to leave my house or probably not have a house. Right. Because <laughs> every human being's an idiot and does really, really stupid things. So, I mean, what am I going to do? I'm not going to buy a Mercedes because of Germany and Hitler. Uh, you would okay. never do that. Frank would never. Frank <laughs> no. supports Mercedes and Nazis. I'm, uh... I'm not going to listen to Howard Stern because of his past. I mean, like, come on. Just let get off your high horse. I'm tired of that crap. Yeah, I I actually had that thought when I after I went to see it. I was like, man, I just supported Scientology. Like, I, and I, you know. It's hard because for those who haven't seen the documentary Going Clear, it is mind-blowing. Some of the stuff that they kind of expose about that church. Um, and even when I was preparing for this, it's funny, Sue, so I'm on Reddit all the time. And Scientology has people that are constantly searching the Internet for information that's coming out about Scientology to try and moderate it. And it's apparently this woman named Karen. And so, like, everyone's trying to, like, talk to Karen. Um, and so it's just really creepy and it makes my skin crawl. Um, and so then I kind of question, should I be doing this? But at the same time, though, it's like, right, I couldn't leave my house. Well, and, you know, you hear all these stories about, like, really brilliant people or people with, like, really brilliant minds. And their brains get overloaded because of all of the inconsistencies or hypocrisies of how we make choices. Like I really, you know, Frank's right. Like if we if we applied all of our value system consistently, we probably couldn't enjoy any form of entertainment. So it's really a, a each individual's kind of reasoning of why they permit this or why they're really rigid with this other celebrity like I don't I don't watch Woody Allen movies I've never seen a single Woody Allen film like Roman Polanski is somebody that I have a I have a lot of issues supporting and I, and for a number of reasons whereas Tom Cruise for whatever reason I don't feel as personally um objected by going seeing a movie for him but but so if other people have a different criteria like to, to me, like that's just how they try to make sense of their value system because there's a lot of Scientologists out there. I mean, Beck is a Scientologist, the musician. I love Beck. I saw him in concert. And so it, to me, uh, I also, you know, there's this weird line and I don't feel like I have the clarity of that. I, at what point it, are you discriminating someone else's right to have beliefs and, and make a career? And then at what other point... If you disagree, you start to discriminate. I don't know. Yeah, it's good stuff. All right. Well, if you have questions or comments about our discussion, you can write us at feedback at shrinktank.com. We'd love to hear from you. We're going to move to our final segment that we call our doctor's orders. These are things that we're personally enjoying in pop culture. And Emma Kate, tell us something. So to prepare for our recent talk on Tom Cruise here, I rewatched the documentary Going Clear, the Scientology and the Prison of Belief. Um, And for those who have not seen this documentary, it is fascinating because it goes through the abuses that this church reportedly has, um, some of the controversies, how they will record – all these confessions essentially and then that information may or may not be used for blackmail so it's super fascinating documentary and jonathan do you have something for us yeah i believe today a film is being released nationwide it's called eighth grade it's comedian who turned writer director Bo burnham's debut film I highly recommend it. It is a very poignant and sensitive look at growing up in middle school in this generation and all of the trials and challenges that they face. The movie is called Eighth Grade. And Frank? I would like to recommend uh, the book The Terror 
by Dan Simmons with a few little caveats. First, uh, it is based on true events of the mission to discover the Northwest Passage. And it's, it's, a, it's a great book if you love nautical history, a lot of detail, um, but it is based on a, an adventure that the crew were lost and it's a it's a really important part of history, but there's a a fictional bent to it where the 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 sailors are being chased by a monster, and and that is not factual, uh, but it adds a great deal to the story. And I would also say I would recommend the TV version as well. Frank, you had me at nautical history. Oh my gosh! <laughs> I swear. And that's going to do it for this edition of the Shrink Tank Podcast. We hope you'll check out shrinktank.com for great articles and videos. And you can also find links to the Doctor's Orders products that we just talked about. And if you're a fan, we hope you go to iTunes and give us a five-star rating and a good review. The more good reviews we have, the more attention it draws, the bigger our audience. And we'd really appreciate it. So please go to iTunes and give us a great rating. You can also follow us on Twitter at shrink underscore tank and like us on Facebook. We hope you'll do that as well. As always, for questions or comments, drop us a note. Our email is feedback at shrinktank.com. Our producer and theme music composer is Sean Beck. And our associate producer and social media guru is Mariel Butler. For Emma Kate Wright, Jonathan Hederley, and Frank Gaskell in Charlotte, I'm Dave Verhagen in Nashville. Please tell all your friends about us and make it a great week. <laughs>